Okay, my name, uh, for those of you who haven't met me before, is Jason Owen Smith. I'm a sociology professor here at the University of Michigan and the executive director of IRIS, the Institute for Research on Innovation and Science. Uh, what I'm hoping to do today is give you very quickly a sense of the broad framework that we use uh, in IRIS both to design our data collection and data building process and also to inform our research and reporting work, which is all aimed at uh, developing new knowledge and uh, better metrics to understand, explain, and hopefully improve the public value of the academic research mission, and eventually, we hope, of higher education generally. Um, IRIS, for those of you who don't know, is formally an IRB-approved data repository housed here at the University of Michigan and in the Institute for Social Research. Um, we, as a data repository, are the anchor for a consortium of right now 35 or so large research universities who all share data with us and help us with the work of developing out uh, new products, reports, and uh, other materials. So the goal for today, and I won't belabor it a ton, um, is to give you a sense of the framework that we use and that underpins the design of IRIS, um, to give you some examples of work we're already doing to communicate about and to provide some intelligence back to our members for talking about research impact, and to give you a sense of where I think we're going. Um, we're not gonna get fully into the sort of strategic IRIS in five years view, but it's important to note that this is a project that has been going on for about five years now, and that is designed to grow with the needs and input of our various constituents, of which uh, the research universities and academic community are front and center. Um, so that's the future directions part, and then we'll open it up for questions and discussion. Very excited to hear what you're thinking after I talk through some of this. So I usually begin these kinds of presentations um, just to set the stage with a, a tiny bit of hyperbole. Uh, actually, probably not hyperbole, but um, in 2018, our society invested $220 on academic research for every man, woman, and child in the country. About 54, 55 cents of the dollar on that came from the federal government. University's institutional spend uh, amounted to another 25 cents on the dollar, and the rest came from states, industry, nonprofits, and then all other sources combined. We make these investments, um, and particularly explicitly the federal investment, to develop the state of human knowledge, but with the more or less explicit promise that the kinds of discoveries and innovations that come out of academic research will, in one form or another, eventually improve the quality of life and well-being of the citizens of our country and the world. The challenge is that we are not typically exceptionally good at explaining how that happens or how we could go about making our work more valuable to society. Now, that's not to say that individual universities and investigators aren't able to do this work very well, but as a sector, um, higher education and particularly academic research, I think tends to get caught in talking more about what we spend than about what our spending lets us do. And that's a challenge for us in a number of ways. It's especially a challenge right now when we're seeing what many believe is a sea change in the public perception of higher education. So recent Pew Research um, polls demonstrate that uh, for the first time, a majority of adults believe that American higher education is going in the wrong direction. That's a stronger for uh, Republican leaning and Republican identified voters, but it holds for everyone across the spectrum. And you can see here a response that's often um, causing some heartburn among our university administrators and others, which is that in recent years, we've seen a dramatic rise among Republican identified voters 
uh, who say that colleges and universities are having a negative effect on the country. So it's not just that the general belief is that we're not doing as much as we could, it's that there are concerns that the work of academia is actively bad for society. And that has all kinds of other implications and is tied to other things, ranging from challenges to the federal funding model for science that have happened under the Trump administration, um, various proposals for caps on or changes to indirect cost models. For public universities, we've been in a period of significant state divestment um, for a long time now, but accelerating since the Great, Rece Great Recession. All those things together that mean that universities are paying for more and more of their own research work themselves um, from institutional funds and tuition funds and gifts. And all of this together means that we face a time period where if we can't do a better job of explaining systematically what it is that academic research does for our society and why it's an important thing to invest in, I think we're gonna face uh, real political challenges moving forward at both the state and the federal level. One of the challenges or problems is that we tend not to be able to explicate how investments of various sorts in our work result in the kinds of outcomes that are important to many of our constituents. I'm sometimes asked to give a presentation with just one slide, and if I only am allowed one slide, I usually use this old New Yorker cartoon. The key challenge of, I think, academic policy and of metrics and measurement is that we're pretty good at saying what comes into our institutions, and we're pretty good at saying, you know, here is a story or two, here's an anecdote about how the work of a university or a research project improved the world. We're less good at systematically explaining the miracle in step two. And so in this frame, we developed IRIS with the idea that what it would allow us to do is systematically collect, integrate, clean, protect, and share for research purposes data that could potentially for the first time allow us to begin to do the work to fill in that step two. So the general framework is the idea that for lack of a better term, grants, sponsored projects, investments of money, don't in and of themselves have an impact on either knowledge or society. Instead, investments of various sorts flow into universities where they enable work to happen. When a grant hits our campus, if I'm the PI, what it allows me to do is tool up to hire the people and buy the stuff necessary to get the research work that I've proposed done. That happens on a platform that's built institutionally and maintained by the university and within a scaffold of existing collaborative relationships between myself and my colleagues here and around the country and sometimes the world. It's the work that institutional investments allow that generate the kinds of things that we think of as the real outputs of academic research. In this case, new discoveries, learning and training of skilled people, and the ability through a variety of mechanisms to disseminate those findings in a more or less open way. Along the way, when we do that spending and we hire those people, um, we're sending money that came into the university out into the economy. Research work has, and we can demonstrate in some systematic ways how, economic stimulus effects. It supports jobs. It helps allow universities to be the centerpiece and the anchor of often thriving regional economies. That's not the primary purpose of research funding, but I think we fail um, to talk in systematic ways about how that is the case. Most importantly, publications or patents, the kinds of things that someone like me produces don't have an impact themselves either, generally. What has an impact that makes a difference for society is when the, the knowledge and the skilled people who are trained and developed through the work of research leave the institution and are landing all over our economy and society 
where they can apply the knowledge that they've gained or where information in a publication can be turned to a new problem. And it's that movement, particularly of the skilled people, we believe, that leads to the kinds of large scale public value and impact that are really important for us to be able to explain. We too often, I think, get trapped in just talking about the investments. Um, we talk about how much we spend rather than how what, what that spending allows us to do and what the work we do results in, in terms of both academic outcomes and others. So IRIS was designed to build a data set that would allow us to flesh out that entire framework and to begin to do um, the fundamental research, fairly fundamental social science research, that could inform the development of new metrics and reports to explain and hopefully help us improve these kinds of work. So this is a snapshot of what IRIS looks like. Member institutions, universities, join us and they share data. The data that I'm going to be talking about are administrative data. They're really fine-grained record level information on the direct cost expenditures of federal and non-federal sponsored projects, which means that our university partners go into their HR procurement and sponsored project systems and pull from those detailed data about every payment of wages from a grant to a person, every purchase of goods and services from a vendor, every subcontract to another performer. We ingest those data, we clean and integrate them, and we make a bunch of data linkages to scientific outcome information, including patents, publications, dissertation data, as well as contextual data about the grants themselves, such as their abstracts and titles, that allow us to know more about the contents of the research. Four times a year, we share those data with our partners at the US Census Bureau. In the Census Bureau context, linkages are made to restricted federal data sets. One is called the Longitudinal Employer Household Dynamics data set, the other the Longitudinal Business data set, which allow us to see employment outcomes for people who were trained in grants and leave the university to get jobs anywhere in the US economy. These two are administrative data, and in the census infrastructure, they're based largely on tax information, IRS W-2 wages, and on unemployment insurance information from all 50 states. We also link these data um, together in order to tell us more about the vendors who are part of if you will, the supply chain of academic research, who prepare and sell the goods and services that are necessary to get the work done. We use those linked data, which allow us to see investments turning into the inputs of work, work producing scientific outcomes and trained people who leave the academy and land in employers in the, prob in, in the public sector, the private sector, and government. And we take those data and develop a series of reports that return to our universities that descriptively begin to flesh out aspects of this general framework. We also de-identify the data and make it available for research use through a virtual data enclave and through the Federal Statistical Research Data Center system, which ensures not only that we're returning information that we know helps explain things now, but that we're developing new ways to do this work. The framework I'm going to describe to you comes from a book I wrote a little while ago, and the idea is that if you think about this framework, there are three metaphors for understanding how academic research work has this kind of impact. We can talk about universities as sources of new knowledge and skilled people, as anchors for regional economic development and various sorts of community, and as hubs, which because they send people and ideas out all over the economy, connect disparate parts of our society and form a kind of shortcut. And it's these three metaphors that inform the ways we think about measurement and some of the examples we've developed. So I'm going to talk about sources first. The idea here is that the investments in research allow us to do work. It's the work that causes the outputs. So we can dig into what that work looks like. One of the first questions you can ask is simply, who does research funding support on campus? 
One of the things that we've not been as good at saying is that when these grants flow into the university, it's important. In fact, across 28 universities for fiscal 2016, and we now have data for 33 that we're working on cleaning now, um, about 145,000 people were paid some salary by federal grants alone working on the campus. Nearly 40% of those were students, another six or 7% were postdoctoral trainees, and only one in five were faculty. The rest were professional staff of various sorts. And so as an initial move to think about measuring the process and talking about initial early stage impact, you can simply think about using data like what IRIS collects in order to be able to turn information that is used for accounting on grants to information about people, teams, and their careers. And this is what's key to understanding how universities are sources. We can also break this down by federal funding agency, which is probably less interesting in this framework, but important to say, because different funding agencies have different missions and researchers working with funding from different agencies tend to rely on different mixes of workforce. So you can talk about the ways in which a particular portfolio or area of research is more or less involved, for instance, with the training of students. What's probably more important is the notion that all of this work is aimed at innovation. Now, I just put a picture of a hamster cage up on the screen, and you may be wondering, quite rightly, why I would put a hamster cage on the screen. The answer is that this is a way to start to think about the underlying process of innovation. So most academics who study the innovative and creative process believe that new discoveries are largely a result of a process of recombination. It's not that new discoveries spring fully formed and with no precursors from the head of Zeus, like Athena. Instead, it's the case that people take existing bits of knowledge and skill and put them together in novel ways, which brings us back to the hamster cage. So, I'm giving this webinar I only sometimes give webinars like this. I was sitting late at night wondering about the webinar, feeling a little nervous, and I was watching my hamsters who soothed me. And I was wondering, what should one wear for a webinar like this? I mean, I'm on a camera, but it's a small camera. I thought perhaps something a little jaunty, like a Hawaiian shirt. And then it hit me. U.S. patent number 5,901,666. Pet display clothing. I could have my Hawaiian shirt and a habit trail for my soothing hamsters. This is actually a real patent, and I don't imagine that it's one that had a big social impact, but I put it up as an illustrative case to just help get the sense that the process we're interested in understanding and improving and explaining is a process by which creative people in particular places take existing bits of knowledge and put them together in new ways, some of which, like pet display clothing, fail, but others of which result in truly novel discoveries and truly novel ways of putting together skills and capabilities. So you might think about the university and academic research in these terms as a big bucket of Lego bricks. The bricks are the skills of the people who are working in the university, the knowledge that's already present, um, the history and legacy of past scientific and research discoveries, and your current faculty and staff and students. All those people who are paid on research grants are in the process of searching for the information they need to put together to solve a problem that hasn't been solved before or to create a new and better way to address a problem that is already known. Which leads us to want to ask, how do these kinds of recombinations happen? And how can we begin to map and measure the kind of recombinant innovation that we see and we believe is one of the core benefits of academic research, the thing that universities are the source of? One answer that we've started working on with IRIS is to think systematically about the fact that most research, contemporary research, is a team sport. 
most people who have large research programs rely on many folks who are working with and for them. And they often rely on multiple grants to pull together the kind of program that they need. We can then take these data and understand them and map them and quantify characteristics of them as a network where nodes are people and ties represent being paid by the same grant in the same time period. What you see here is a snapshot of a single university with a big cluster of biomedical grants and a medical school and a land bridge through public health into the arts and sciences. One of the things we can also do because we collect and integrate abstracts is put topics on these areas by using a bunch of new methods in natural language processing to better understand what is being studied by different groups. And this in principle allows us to think about what the capabilities for recombination through networked collaboration and teamwork are for a given institution. So in this example, you see a large social science group that is working on topics based on a project that has to do with the correlates of homelessness for teenagers, a bench science group working on HIV AIDS vaccines, and they're bridged by liver cancer and organ transplant specialists, clinicians from the medical school. What this suggests is that this is a small piece of a network where it's possible for social science knowledge and bench science knowledge to be combined by clinicians who are serving as consultants on grants where when a teenager gets hepatitis C because they're homeless, one of the challenges is liver failure. And for a group who's working on HIV AIDS, when someone transitions from HIV to full-blown AIDS, one of the first challenges is liver failure and liver cancer. And it's these maps that allow us to think about what's recombinant and to think about how we can take information about the current topics and organization of topics on a campus and use them to make sense of the capabilities of the university and of its systems and of a system of universities both for training and for research. We believe that these kinds of quantifiable measures of collaboration capabilities and recombinant possibilities give you a great baseline to begin to explain how investments of funding result in outcomes and begin to fill in that step two. There are a bunch of findings and we can make these slides available for people to see from early research using the IRIS data. I won't go through them all, but we're beginning to see important information about how sources of funding, characteristics of teams and individuals have important influences on the scientific and career outcomes of these research teams, which means that we're beginning to start to understand and to be able to measure and report how it is that investments enable work and that work produces the things that flow out into society to have an impact. We can also talk about universities as anchors. And this is more the part where we think about how the spending that is done in order to enable the work has effects that ripple in economic terms beyond the university itself. One of the arguments would be that large research institutions and in fact any higher education institution have the effect of making the communities and regions that they inhabit more resilient. One of the things I know about the University of Michigan is that it's unlikely to go out of business anytime soon. And more importantly, probably, um, it's unlikely to pick up and move to Alabama or Texas or Singapore, which in my part of the country is not true of almost any other major employer. Um, what that means is that universities and colleges represent a kind of permanent endowment in their region, and it's in that sense that they serve as anchors. It's also, the case that they serve as anchors in a more metaphorical way. And this is important to think about. Retail marketing folks talk about the anchor tenants of shopping malls or strip malls or any kind of collective endeavor. These are the big organizations that sit at the end of the malls in this case and that draw the foot traffic that allows the smaller organizations inside the mall to thrive. If you think in these terms about universities, you have to ask yourself, not just how stable 
one of the work of the universities. But how does the distinctive work of universities and colleges shape the tone and characteristics of the regions they're a part of? And when we start to talk about investments from, for instance, state sources, that becomes really important because the counterfactual for investments in organizations like public universities at the state level is not throwing a bunch of public money into a bonfire. Typically, it's about making trade-offs between various needs for the state. There are 11 states in the country, including Michigan, that spend more on their prisons than they do on universities. And conceptually, this notion of universities as an anchor leads you to ask, what would you expect to be the kinds of employers or organizations that are situated near or around a prison as opposed to a university? I always like, you ring, we spring. Um, obviously, it's not the case that bail bondsmen dominate the uh, employment around prisons, but it is the case, and we can demonstrate from public data, that universities are more, university areas are more likely to be home to professional services firms and research labs and publishers and a variety of other sort of economically dynamic organizations where the areas around prisons tend to be more closely associated with social service organizations and churches right, and other sorts of organizations that are very important, but that are not motors for growth quite often. And this takes us back to the IRIS data and asks us how we can begin to think about measuring this. Because we can track at a very fine-grained level what's being purchased in order to support research, we can, for at least this part of the university mission, really dig into and better understand where the money flows to what industries in what geographies. What you see here is a national map at the county level of research expenditures from the universities that are represented in red dots in terms simply of where the vendors are located. And what you'll immediately notice is that the areas right around the universities tend to be dark, universities are anchors, but because of the nature of academic research and of the necessary inputs, this is actually a nationally distributed map, um, which is important when we begin, for instance, to talk to elected representatives in Washington, D.C about why they might want to support this work, when in the near term, it may even be the case that a lot of the research funds from the federal government don't flow to a university in their state. This allows us to emphasize the kind of ripple effects that I talked about. That map shows you purchases of $3.2 billion of goods and services from research for research from vendors in 1,900 counties, and critically for purposes of government relations at least, 435 federal congressional districts. It also suggests that as we start to peel this out, what we can focus on is not entirely the amount of money or its stability, but as I suggested with the shopping mall metaphor, the jobs and sectors and regionally important industries that are supported by universities. So the average Irish university from our last data tranche, for instance, in terms of industry purchased $78 million from 121 distinct firms that were professional scientific and technical service firms. According to census data that we link, those firms employed an additional 15,600 or so people in this industry, and those sal their salaries were about 36% higher than the national average. So while it's not the purpose of science funding, we can lay out in quite specific terms and produce maps and other information that allow us to say precisely how the research work of universities is touching people employed in lots of other sectors and having a secondary impact on economic development. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time here, but we're also able to contextualize this work by asking not just where are universities spending money, but also what are the dominant employers in the regions we're looking at? We've done this down to the county level 
for now in some of our reports. And this is a way to be able to talk specifically about the anchoring effects of regions in terms not of employment on campus, but of employment around the campus, um, which is another essential thing for thinking about our various constituencies. Wow, we can come back to the prisons. Sorry about that. But one way to think about this is if we return to the bail bondsman and ask who is a tenant around a university, this is an example we found in working with the communications office of the vice president for communications at the University of Michigan. Carlin's Creations is a small engineering firm on the west side of the state of Michigan that we found $70,000 worth of purchases from NIH grants. When we developed this story out with the communications professionals, what they discovered is that these grants supported a faculty member who studied the effects of exercise on the physical development of infants with Down syndrome and found that 12 minutes or so a day of treadmill training for an infant resulted in them walking four to six months earlier. Now, that required that this person develop and purchase a set of infant treadmills, which are not something that you can just walk into your local Walmart and buy. Um, instead, he took a set of blueprints to this engineering company and they developed a new product line. Product line is the infant treadmills, which they sell around the country and which allow them to employ a handful of people in the state. So the university could then take this information and generate a press release and a set of stories and in fact a, a video that played among other things in a snapshot in a commercial at the Fiesta Bowl. And what they showed is this, the faculty member who was supported by NIH with the super cute infant on the treadmill doing the research that resulted in a finding that has implications for the health of children, but also has nearer term economic implications for the state and region that we're in. There are a bunch of findings we can put together from IRIS as well. And you can see in very extreme terms, this is a story from the New York Times last weekend about a new effort by Northeastern University to open a technical branch campus with significant support from a private donor in Portland, Maine, which doesn't have a university. And the idea here is precisely that in a region, this kind of academic research can be an anchor and, as they say here, a hub. Brings us to the last thing. Universities are hubs. Metaphorically, universities are sort of one step from everywhere. And this is a picture of O'Hare Terminal. But the idea here is that because universities do work teaching and research primarily across a massive range of fields and areas, when people and knowledge leave the university and land elsewhere in society, they land all over. And that means that in principle, universities are shortcuts the way a hub airport is between far-flung locations, which increases the likelihood that problems and solutions and opportunities that are active in different parts of society will flow back to the university and allow us to develop responses. You can think about this from IRIS data in terms of career outcomes. And I said an essential component of what we do is to think about the work that is done and the ways in which that helps people develop skills and knowledge which they apply. This is a snapshot of a table from a paper we published a few years ago that we're working on expanding now, which uses census data and ProQuest patent data with IRIS data to understand where doctoral recipients who were funded on federal grants get jobs. The doctoral recipients here are overrepresented in these industries relative to the population. And if you look at it, what you see is that universities are producing exceptionally highly skilled people who are getting jobs all over the core of the US knowledge economy. You can also talk about where people go from the census data. And this is another measure. We've often thought about measuring university competitiveness with each other and in other cases by thinking about how far flung geographically the people they draw to them are. 
We can also think about how the work of universities helps to provide a workforce that is really well trained for their regions. Many of our initial universities in this tranche were in the Big Ten and for the nation as a whole. And it's these kinds of flows between universities and their locations and other locations and indeed between universities and industries. This is data drawn from a pilot project that looks at career outcomes using data, census data for all en enrolled students. And what this does is tell you what area did someone get a PhD in and what industry were they working in five years post-graduation. What's immediately apparent is that the dark line here is that most people who are trained in research as PhDs work in academia, but these fields vary a great deal in where else they send people. So computer and information science is sort of a generalist in terms of employment destinations. And history, for instance, is a little bit more specialized in education. Um, the idea here is that we can systematically begin to quantify not only the immediate near-term economic contribution and the characteristics of universities that make them sources consistently, but the extent and character, if you will, of their hubness by following not just documents, though we do do work with publications, patents, and citations, and they're increasingly thinking about data like licensing data from technology transfer, but critically about their students and research employees. There's also the possibility to think about the role that faculty play. So I won't spend a ton of time diving into this, except to say that this is a snapshot from a paper that we're working on that uses information about Federal Advisory Committee Service, the Federal Advisory Committee Act, FACA database, in order to understand how faculty affiliated with universities contribute to executive branch advisory communities focus on policy. And this is a snapshot that shows you what the topics people are providing public service to are how concentrated they are in a few universities, right, and how many people are serving. Again, you get this sense that across the very broad sweep of topics that our federal government, the executive branch, is concerned about, universities, at least some of them, and quite often, if you look in this order, a large number of them are contributing expertise. And this is another way to think about public value and what flows out of the university. It's also a way to think about the university's hubness and the ways in which its faculty and other researchers might discover and make use of new problems and ideas. So what I'd like to say is that this framework and the data that we're beginning to develop and the measures we're beginning to develop and the research we're enabling allows us to think about the systematic ways that universities and academic research keep our society poised to address problems that we don't necessarily know we have yet and take advantage of opportunities that we might have difficulty envisioning right now. And they do that because they're hubs. What that means is that problems and opportunities from all over our economy and society are likely to flow to them. Because they're sources and because they represent a system of differently organized recombinant possibilities for innovation, when those problems or opportunities land in universities, there's a better than average chance that one or more of them will have the capabilities necessary to address it. And because they're anchors, because they're stable and help to create around them vibrant economic and social and cultural communities, they represent a kind of permanent endowment of skills and capabilities. But we have to be able to defend and explain them. You can see how this works in a variety of ways, but one good example is in the recent development of the Zika virus, where no one really expected this virus to turn into what it did. Certainly didn't expect to have a CDC issued announcement that we shouldn't fly to Miami, Florida if we're pregnant. But within weeks, if not even a little bit faster, university labs around the country that hadn't been studying Zika discovered aspects of these problems and then put together it from existing federal funding and infrastructure, in this example, all using CRISPR, a new technology that was developed in 2013, responses 
that ranged from identifying key proteins to developing mouse models for testing vaccines to beginning work on a new antiviral compound. This is the kind of case that we want to be able to talk about where universities represent a sort of rapid response capability. And this is a story from the Washington Post last week that describes exactly this process happening again, only an international lens with the coronavirus. We've not yet started to think in detailed ways about how to integrate the more international aspects of work, but this is becoming both in the positive case and in the negative case, a much more important question for universities and data like those we develop allow for new possibilities to think about how we understand not just the local anchoring effects of universities, but the extent to which they really truly are global scientific hubs. I'll stop there. What I've given you is a broad sense of a framework that is instantiated in a large scale national data collection effort that has for the last five years been producing findings and reports of potential value to our university members and also in the aggregate to organizations like the Association of American Universities or the National Science Foundation or the Big Ten Academic Alliance. It's also a platform for research to happen to allow us to develop better measures and metrics and to think about the ways in which the same investment in research has positive effects on multiple timescales. In the near term, by contributing to university's hubness. In the medium term, by training people who will flow out into the workforce around the economy. And in the long term, by providing a sort of social insurance policy against an uncertain future and by turning some of the innovations, at least, into new products, processes, and even industries. And it's that that is the final goal of the measurement efforts of IRIS. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jason. We have one question uh, from chat. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is, um, did you say that you have UI data on all 50 states? Uh, we do not have. Um, the Census Bureau maintains through the LEHD program, uh, that's Longitudinal Employer Household Dynamics, um, a data set that is comprised in part, it's what the sense in the census infrastructure is called commingled data. Um, so it's Title 13 data that is UI wage information from all 50 states. Uh, commingled with some IRS W-2 data. And that data set is available with appropriate um, uh, approvals for research use. Uh, we work with the Census Bureau in a process of developing some new measures uh, for their purposes of industry dynamism and innovation. And that's how we get access to these data. So short answer is yes, um, but it's very important to say that those data are protected by and never leave uh, without fairly strict privacy disclosure protections, um, the Census Bureau. Yes, and a follow-up question, does it include self-employed individuals? Um, this iteration does not. We are still working on um, the self-employed data, which is mostly Schedule C and 1099 data. Uh, we've done some pilot tests with that, but that is a messier data source, and it's important to make sure that we capture the right things here so that we're capturing true self-employment and not, for instance, um, the occasional consulting arrangement for faculty. So that might be important to do. We also should say that one of the future directions for thinking about innovation and one of the papers that I cited but that we have not, I didn't spend a ton of time on, use those data and also data on um, what you would call the transition to employment um, when a new company first hires someone and files for an EIN to see a leading indicator of entrepreneurship and to be able to better understand the contributions of this kind of uh, research work 
to particularly high technology and high growth startups. There was another question. Um, I don't know how long you want to spend on it, but there was a question about uh, what kind of reports members get. Do, do mm -hmm. members get standard reports based on these data for their own institutional effectiveness or only for additional research? Um, so, IRIS membership, and I'm happy uh, for whomever asked, asked the question, if you'd like to follow up with us, um, I didn't want to dive into it on this, but I'm very happy to offer a demonstration of some of the reporting. Um, we can do another call. IRIS membership carries with it um, access for your affiliated researchers to the research data and a series of standard reports. Um, they're interactive, they're served back to our member universities via a secure web portal that we maintain. Right now, the core reports, there are three of them and you saw chunks of them in um, these, this presentation. There's what's called the spending report, which produces the vendor maps at the county and congressional district level. We're working on one now for state legislative districts. Uh, for your state and for the nation, for your university's vendor spend, as well as the basic information about who's employed on grants on campus and how that varies across funding agencies. That also allows for benchmarking against aggregates of other Irish universities, though not currently for head-to-head -head benchmarking. Um, there is what's called the vendor report, the vendor report is where all the information I used when I was talking about ripple effects and the, um, the employment by vendors and uh, the dominant industries as opposed to the spending industries in particular geographies can be found and that lets you explore your university's vendor profile right now down to the county level and in terms of industries. And then there's what's called the employee report which gives you um, for your university a variant of the map that I showed where research employees go. That was an aggregate version of it. And also information about where particularly graduate students and postdocs find employment um, in three year moving windows. So one to three, three to five years after departing the university. What sectors they are working in and how much they earn on average. Those. Those reports are primarily used for government relations communications and increasingly um, by graduate schools and also for thinking about things like bridging funds. We're working on with our members a series of new reports, the most uh, detailed of which builds on some of the source language that we've been talking about to look at the career trajectories of early career faculty who were supported by NIHK awards. And we're expanding that now to think about other sources of early career funding. So that was a long answer. The short answer is yes, there are university specific reports that come back to an institution for their use. Um, and we work very closely with our institutions in piloting and developing new ones that might be valuable and in trying to use the current research that is being done to inform those. It was a quick question on how frequently universities provide data to IRIS. Yep, absolutely. Um, when a university joins IRIS, we ask initially for what we call the historical tranche of data. That's a data pool that goes as far back as your systems will allow. In most cases, that's till the last time you had um, a sort of enterprise reboot of your systems. After that, we ask for an annual update of data. Most universities prefer to do that 60 to 90 days after the close of their fiscal year to make sure that they've handled and an immediate journal entry and other kinds of, of challenges. Um, so we do annual updates and our reporting comes back on an annual cycle. Two of our four census data transfers underpin um, the university specific reporting that relies on census data. So depending on when your data comes to us, you'd be included in one of those. 
and on the order of a month or two after that transfer happens, we'll be getting you back a draft report. Well, we're running out of time. There was one other question. I don't know how much time you want to spend on this, but uh, the question had to do with um, the slide that touched on um, gender bias and academic success, which prompted the question, how does IRIS set priorities for its research reports? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. And so I assume you mean this slide. Um, these findings are out of research driven by the academic investigators who are listed. So these are all published papers or working papers um, that I've summarized. We prioritize report building. Um, the initial set of reports was developed through a pilot process with the senior research officers of the Big Ten Academic Alliance, which is where we developed some of the basics of this, and we've expanded those. That's the vendor employee and spending report. Um, the new report that I talked about for early career faculty has been developed with a subgroup of 10 Irish universities who are particularly interested in the outcomes of K Award, um, mentored K Award training. We work in two fashions. Uh, one is through what we call our policy and outreach committee. The university members can have representatives on that committee and they help us think about needs and uses and how to communicate from the IRIS data um, and share information and best practices. Dan is very, very involved with that group. Uh, we also work through uh, an annual meeting that we call the IRIS Summit that brings together technical representatives who pull and submit the data, um, policy and outreach folks who use the reports, and researchers who are actively working with the research data. And a large part of the focus of that is bringing pilot um, information to the group and having a conversation about what might be valuable to develop. Um, so the idea is that we began with a focus a little bit more on communications and government outreach around the nearer term impacts of research. And we've been moving more and more uh, in part through the interests of our researchers, but also through the interests of our members toward developing out information that's more about what I would call the source and hub-like characteristics of universities. So one thing that being a member of IRIS means is that you have an opportunity to be involved in governance. Um, we're governed by a board of directors that's elected from our members, membership by our membership, um, and also in these kinds of uh, advisory committee and pilot work. Great. Well, I think uh, we're coming to the end of our time, and I very much appreciate your all's uh, sticking with us and joining us. I would encourage you, please, to follow up with myself or Dan if there are other questions we can answer or if it might be worthwhile uh, to have a more specific conversation about your institution or particular reporting efforts that you have going on. One of the things we're trying very hard to do is to help to be a little bit of a clearinghouse, a hub, if you will, in our own right, um, to help academics and researchers interested in this and universities be better able to make use of data like those we produce for these purposes. Dan, do we have any last minute questions or should we wrap up? I don't believe so.